So let me introduce Dr. Talamy. He's a professor of entomology, and actually his title is a lot more complicated because he has a chaired uh, professorship now, but he's at the University of Delaware. He's a noted research scientist with over 130 publications. Many of those each have over 100 citations. Dr. Talamy has served as the major professor for at least seven PhD students and 20 master, master students. In addition to his stellar academic career, he is also an award-winning, best-selling author and a very eloquent speaker. Doug has the rare ability to distill complicated scientific research into actionable and understandable popular concepts. Let's see. There's a graphic that you saw before the meeting that has four, uh, Dr. Talamy's four books. The first one was originally published in 2007, Bringing Nature Home. And that was really the beginning of a, what you, I'm gonna use the overused expression paradigm shift in the way we view uh, insects interactions with plants. In 2014, he co-authored with Rick Dark, uh, The Living Landscape. That was the first book that I saw that broke down landscape plants by species and separated their landscape value with their ecosystem value. And by using icons to represent different ecosystem functions and different landscape functions, uh, that was a very beneficial book for me. It has different tables for different parts of the country. So if you haven't seen that, um, you can take a look at it. Last year, he published Nature's Best Hope. I think it came out in February. The Middle Tennessee Club had several book, book club meetings about it. And his new book coming out at the end of the month is The Nature of Oaks. And he will be speaking about that, I believe, at the Plant Natives 2021 conference that the Tennessee Valley chapter is hosting later this month. So um, let me turn this over to Dr. Talley and take it away and we will regroup um, with questions at the end. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Richard. You know more about me than I do. <clears throat> okay, tonight I wanna, I wanna talk about uh, restoring nature's relationships and certainly we wanna do that at home, but we wanna do it everywhere. But before I do, I want to describe what nature is. It's a series of very specialized relationships. There are some generalized relationships, but most of them are specialized, and this is one of them. This is the resplendent quetzal. It's an endangered species in the uh, forests of Central America, and it's endangered for one primary reason. It has a very specialized diet. If you don't have the fruits of the wild avocado tree, you don't have that beautiful bird. And of course, we've cut down most of the wild avocado trees. But we figured out if we want that bird, we can actually plant those trees again. And that's what these folks are doing here. That's an avocado tree right there. Fortunately, they grow pretty quickly. They reach the age at which they produce those fruits in not too many years. And it's starting to look better for the future of that, that beautiful bird. If you wanna save jaguars, you have to have particular species of palm trees. Why palm trees? Because they make palm nuts. And palm nuts happen to be the favorite food of peccaries, which is the favorite food of jaguars. So specialization in this way uh, in the natural world is the rule, particularly specialization focused on food webs. <clears throat> and it always starts with plants. Now, a lot of people think that all that specialization occurs in the tropics because there are so many specialized relationships in the tropical areas of the world. But there's a lot of specialized relationships up here in the temperate zone as well. And some of the most specialized relationships that occur anywhere occur right in our yards. This is one of them. This is a female bola spider. Uh, and uh, she's unlike other spiders. She does not spin a web. She simply drops a single strand of silk and holds it out like this with one sticky glob, sticky glob of glue at the end there. Um, now she doesn't swing it around her head like a, like a bolus, but um, she does. It looks like she goes fishing with it. She lowers it and raises it and lowers it real slowly. Uh, and if uh, something flies by, she does flick it at it. But um, you know, that's the way I used to fish and I didn't catch anything. So first time I saw one of these in my backyard, I told her, you're not going to catch anything. But about 15 seconds later, a moth flew in and, and she nailed it. It got stuck on her sticky glob of glue. She reeled it in um, and spent quite some time um, wrapping it up. And she essentially turned it into an elaborate egg mass. Well, I learned later that um, that was not a mistake or an accident. The, uh, the moth did not just happen to fly by. She was releasing the sex pheromone of that particular species of moth. Uh, so he thought she was a female. 
uh, he flew in. Uh, she was a female, but she was uh, the wrong species. And that was the end of him. Uh, and it turns out that every species of Ebola spider in the world mimics the sex pheromone of particular species of moths. So you can have bola spiders in your yard. If you have the plant that supports the caterpillar development of the moth that your bola spider is mimicking the sex pheromone of. Very, very specialized relationships. This is Phlox de Varicata, common spring ephemeral in our gardens and it spreads readily from seed, but only if it's pollinated. And if you look at the entrance to the corolla, it's extremely narrow. I've watched native bees land on these flowers and try to get their mouth parts in there and they can't, they're too narrow. Uh, so who's pollinating our flocks? Well, it turns out it's day flying sphinx moths. Things like this hummingbird sphinx or this snowberry clear wing. They have very long tongues and they sink them deep into the corolla of those flowers. And when they come bring them out, they're full of pollen and they fly to the next flower and that's how they get pollinated. So you can get your flocks pollinated, make lo lots of flock seed if you have adult snowberry clear wings. And you can have adult snowberry clear wings if you have larval snowberry clear wings. And you can have larval snowberry clear wings if you have coral honeysuckle. That is uh, the native honeysuckle and that is the host plant for that, that moth. Even animals we don't think of as having specialized relationship with plants often do, at least at one part of their life history. And I'm gonna use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Uh, the Native Americans called uh, the Carolina chickadee the bird of truth. So everything the chickadee tells us is the absolute truth. And of course, they're the birds sitting at our, with other chickadees, the black cap chickadee, um, are the ones at our feeders during the winter time. Half their diet in the wintertime is seeds, and we tend to think, well, that's all they need. But uh, when it comes time to reproduce, their babies can't eat seeds. So they switch to insects, and if they're in a healthy environment, chickadees will feed their young exclusively on caterpillars. Uh, and it turns out they are not exceptions. Most of our, our birds in North America rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. So why caterpillars? What's special about caterpillars? There's a number of things that are special. One of them is that they are soft. So if you think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper, the thin wrapper is, is exoskeleton, it's cuticle made of chitin, it is undigestible and the birds don't want a lot of that. And because it's uh, soft, they can stuff the caterpillar down the, the throat of their offspring without fear of injuring it. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough, their beak is like a plunger, they just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items, one medium sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of chitin compared to most other insects, particularly uh, beetles, which are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. Most of a beetle is undigestible and beetles also have lots of sharp edges. And it turns out that uh, caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get them from plants and we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Well, chickadee is a vertebrate and it's not eating plants. So where's it getting it carotenoids? It's getting it from something that did eat plants. Uh, and that of course are all the, the prey items that birds eat. But carotenoid content is not equally distributed among bird prey. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars, and there are far more carotenoids in caterpillars than any other type of bird prey item. Third bar is uh, orthopteroids, so things like crickets and grasshoppers and katydids. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and the butterflies themselves, far fewer carotenoids uh, because they're not eating green leaves. It's the caterpillars that ate the green leaves. And here's the earthworm way over here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So uh, there's a lot of data that's suggesting that caterpillars are probably not optional parts of bird diet. It's looking like they are essential parts of bird diets, which means they, there can be no chickadees if we don't have enough caterpillars. And that leads us to the next question. What is enough caterpillars? How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? Well, it takes lots. And I learned that from chickadees in my backyard. Uh, years ago, I put up a chickadee box. I wanted to take pictures of what they were bringing back to the nest. Um, I was just curious. And the first thing I learned is they're bringing back caterpillars, but I was impressed with how fast they were bringing it back. They brought a caterpillar back to the uh, nest once every three minutes. In one uh, 27 minute period, they brought back 30 caterpillars. How do they do that? By bringing back more than one at a time, sometimes a whole bunch. And they're doing this all day long, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. So they're working really hard. 
How many species of caterpillars do the chickadees bring back to the nest? Um, that's a good question. Well, I watched them for three hours. And during that three hours, they brought back 17 different species of caterpillars. So remember, I'm taking pictures of, of the, the caterpillars. I can identify them later on. 17 species in, in three hours. Why is that important? Well, if I had one or two species of caterpillars in my yard, and it happened to be a bad year for those caterpillars, because caterpillar populations really vary a lot. If you have a cool, wet spring, it usually depresses them. Well, there wouldn't be nearly enough caterpillars for the chickadees to be able to successfully reproduce. But if I have 17 species or 34 species or 134 species, and four years ago, I decided to count all the caterpillar species in my yard, take pictures of them. Um, I am up to 1,032 species that I have photographed in my yard, which means that there will always be some combination of those species around, regardless of how bad the weather is, so that there will be enough caterpillars for the chickadees to be able to successfully reproduce. That's the value of diversity. Diversity stabilizes this food web. It stabilizes the, the ecosystem. You've heard that diversity is good. Uh, but that's a main reason. The chickadee gets to breed every year when you have a lot of uh, different types of caterpillars in your yard. Well, Richard Brewer, way back in 1961, um, was studying Carolina chickadees, and he found that they bring back to the nest 390 to 570 caterpillars every day, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And they're in the nest for 16 days, so just to the point where they fledge, that's 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars required to make that one clutch of chickadees. And after they fledge, after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days, but they're flying all around. So you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce. And they are foraging 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road. So if you want chickadees breeding in your yard, and we do want them breeding in our yards because that's pretty much all that's left these days, you need all those caterpillars in your yard. Chickadees, that's four pennies worth of bird. They're tiny birds, yet it takes all those caterpillars. What if I wanted to make a red-bellied woodpecker? It weighs eight times more than a chickadee. How many caterpillars does that take? And I want more than just chickadees and red-bellied woodpeckers in my yard. I want scarlet tanagers and tip mice and blue jays. I want blue birds and, and tree swallows and common yellow throats and indigo bunnings and towhees and yellow warblers and wood thrushes and house wrens and cardinals and hummingbirds. And I don't want one pair. I want breeding populations. And if, all the, if they're not all in my yard, I certainly want them in my neighborhood. So how many caterpillars does that take? But I know what you're thinking. Well, you don't need any caterpillars for the, uh, for the hummingbird here because it eats sugar water. And that's what it's doing right here. But 80 to 90% of a, a hummingbird's diet is insects and spiders. And then it goes to get the sugar water. And that is true for 96% of the terrestrial birds in North America. They're rearing their young directly or indirectly on insect protein. And when I say indirectly, if a bird eats a spider, and many of them do, that spider became a spider by eating insects. So it's really all about insect protein that's driving the bird health and particularly reproduction in North America. So no insects, no baby birds. A bit of a generalization, but not much. How do we do that? How do we, how do we design landscapes that are capable of producing the abundance and diversity of insects that we're talking about here? Well, to answer that question, we have to um, talk about the most common type of specialized relationship that occurs all over the planet. And that's the relationship between the insects that eat plants and the plants themselves. So we're not talking about pollinators right now. We're talking about things like this, this uh, polyphemus moth caterpillar and the oak leaf that it's eating. Remember, plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a very effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there are no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are simply too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Every lineage of plant that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And any one insect species cannot adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two that are very similar in their defense and they develop the specialized adaptations that are required to get around those defenses. The enzymes 
that help them store and excrete or detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations, the life history adaptations that allow them to minimize their exposure to those compounds. But it takes a long period of evolutionary history with those particular plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do, they're locked into eating that particular plant lineages because they didn't spend any time developing adaptations to eat any other type of plant. Let's use the monarch butterfly as an example, because you already know uh, uh, most of the monarch's life cycle. Maybe you know all of it. I don't know. But monarchs, of course, are specialists on milkweeds. And milkweeds are toxic plants. They are protected by compounds we call cardiac glycosides. And if we eat enough milkweeds, uh, it's supposed to stop our hearts. I've never tried it, but um, that's what they say. Milkweeds don't stop monarch hearts because, uh, and monarchs do have hearts, by the way, because they've got those physiological adaptations that, that protect them from cardiac glycosides. That's a good relationship. But what about the sticky latex set? that gives milkweeds its common name. When you split up in a milkweed uh, leaf or a vein on the leaf, all this white goo comes out. If you get it on your finger, you usually wipe it off right away. But if you don't wipe it off, if you let it sit there for a minute or two, it starts to gel. It turns into a chewing gum-like substance. And that is its, its defensive property. If that white goo gets smeared on the mandibles of a caterpillar, it glues its mouth shut permanently. And then the caterpillar starves to death. So it's very, very effective defense. How does the monarch get around that? You can watch this right in your yard, plant milkweed and watch the monarch. It will crawl onto a, a new leaf. And the first thing it does is go to the end of the leaf and start to eat. And if any latex sap starts to come out at all, it will stop eating immediately, turn around, crawl back up the leaf, maybe two thirds of the way. And it starts to chew through the midrib and it chews and it chews until it has completely severed the midrib. And what it's done is block the canals that shunt the latex sap from this part of the leaf to this part of the leaf. So all this part of the leaf now has no latex sap in it. It can turn around, go back down to the end of the leaf and eat and no latex sap comes out at all. That's how monarchs beat milkweed at its own defensive game. It's a very simple behavioral adaptation, but very effective and one that most other insects have not figured out how to do. That also flags the leaves, by the way. So if you're a monarch hunter, you can drive down the road and look at a milkweed patch. If there were flagged leaves, you know there are monarch caterpillars there. Well, those are the upsides of specialization. The monarch can now eat a plant that uh, is very well defended. Most other insects can't eat it. Um, and so there you go. It has a lot to eat as long as we have milkweeds around. The downside of specialization is that now that's all it can eat. Out of the more than 2,000 genera of plants in North America, monarchs can only eat that one. Which means if we get rid of the milkweeds, we get rid of the monarchs. And, and you know, that's pretty much what we've done. 2013 was the low point of the monarch population in the East, only 3.6% of them left. Um, so we've started Monarch Watch and everybody's putting milkweeds in their yard and that helps a lot. But, uh, and the monarchs started to rebuild. This has been a bad winter for them. Uh, and the recent polar vortex that went all the way down to Mexico is another just uh, clobbering the monarchs because it killed all the blooming plants that they need as they start their migration up north. So um, now more than ever, we need people to plant things that are going to bloom and give those monarchs um, the energy to use uh, in flying north, as well as the milkweeds to reproduce. I don't want you to think it's just moths and butterflies that are that are specialists. Uh, this is the elderberry beetle, beetle. It only eats elderberry. Dogbane beetle only eats dogbane. The sumac flea beetle only eats sumac. This is a Korean bug that only eats ash. So if the emerald ash borer kills all of our ashes, we will lose this species. Dave Wagner did a study looking at all the, the species that specialize on ash, and it's around 95 species that will be gone if we lose our ashes. And that's the problem. The fact that so many of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. If you take away the plant they've specialized on, they will disappear. But we can use the knowledge of host specialization to purposely rebuild food webs wherever we want and all of our human dominated landscapes where we've dismantled them if we understand what those food webs are, are comprised of. Uh, and this is how it would work. Let's use the white-eyed vireo as an example. And I'm going to use that as an example because that is the nest that uh, my wife Cindy found in our, our yard. Well, it's been several years now. Um, I want to reconstruct the uh, diet of this white-eyed vireo. So I have to take pictures of what they're bringing back to the nest. Uh, when I take a picture of the caterpillar, I can identify it. 
then I'll know what that caterpillar fed on. We know a lot about what caterpillars eat. Um, so in order to reconstruct the, the diet, I need to uh, be able to take pictures. Then the birds must have known that because they built their nest very low. All I had to do was set up my camera and snap away. So let's see what they brought back. Here's a blinded sphinx moth. It's a specialist on black cherry. But we have a lot of black cherry in our yard making blinded sphinx moths so the babies get to eat. This is a chestnut shizura. It's a specialist on our uh, local viburnum, um, viburnum dentatum. I know it's viburnum dentatum because I planted it. Our yard was mowed for hay before we moved in. And uh, we know an awful lot of the plants that are here because we put them back uh, and is now making chestnut shizuras so the babies get to eat again. This guy with the white stripe is a drab prominent. It's a specialist on sycamore. We did not plant sycamore. Um, but a couple of years after we moved in, there was a big wind blew in sycamore seeds from who knows where. One landed in my cold frame and germinated. It is now, I don't know, it's got to be 70 feet tall. I don't have a cold frame anymore, but it's making lots of drab prominence so the babies get to eat again. On and on we go. This is the eight spotted forester moth, a specialist on native grapes. We have lots of those. This is the lunate zaley, another specialist on black cherry. This is the spicebush swallowtail caterpillar. There's its, its phony eye. It's supposed to scare the bird into thinking it's a tree snake. It didn't work, work this time. It's a specialist on spicebush and its close relative sassafras. We have both of those. Here's the tufted bird dropping moth, another specialist on, on black cherry. So black cherry is emerging as a really important component of this bird's food web. But these guys are hungry. They need a lot more than that. So let's put in some black walnut. If we do that, we get the walnut sphinx, the gray edged boma loca, the black blotch cesura, the bride, all specialists on black, black walnut in my yard. Native maples will give us uh, Plagodes inchworms, the green striped maple worm, the maple bantam dagger moth, and of course, many others. Native elms will give us the four horned sphinx, the double tooth prominent, the interrupted dagger moth. These are just examples of the species that are on these powerhouse plants. Remember, 90% of the insects that, that the white-eyed vireo needs to rear its young won't be there unless you have the plants that, that produce those insects. So if we want the mustard sallow, we need witch hazel. No compromise. If we want the hackberry emperor, we need hackberry. If you want Caculio asteroides, you need native asters. The Arcidura flower moth and brown hooded owlet need goldenrod. The hog sphinx, Pandora sphinx, Abbott sphinx all need Virginia creeper. The red bud leaf roller needs red bud. The gray furcula needs native willows. The turbulent phosphilla needs greenbrier. And the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the Pink, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species require oaks. Why do we need all these insects? Well, the birds need them, but it's not just the birds. All spiders eat insects, or they, they ate other spiders that ate insects. Uh, and I know a lot of you don't like, like spiders, but look who does. It's the second most important component of bird food webs. Plus, they're really valuable uh, uh, predators. You know, rather than hiring Mosquito Joe that kills all the insects in your yard, don't kill the spiders. That'll help. Then we have a lot of insect predators that are eating insect herbivores. They themselves are important components of, of bird food webs. Frogs need insects, toads need insects, all of the amphibians need insects. That's what they eat. So do lizards, so do bats, so do rodents. Why? Because they're really good food. Pound for pound, there's twice as much protein in insect meat as there is in beef, some studies have shown. And insects have organs in their abdomen uh, called fat bodies that are loaded with lipids, high energy compounds that uh, are are allow these guys to grow quickly and reproduce quickly. And of course, if you're a mouse, you want to do that because there's a lot of things that want to eat you. But it's the same reason that larger organisms are eating insects. They're just really good food. The skunk is, is digging up your yard to get the grubs that are in your yard. Possums eat a lot of insects. Raccoons eat a lot of insects. Even things we don't think of as insectivores eat a lot of insects. Like the red fox, 25% of its diet is insects. Who knew? 23% of a black bear's diet is insects. So it doesn't matter how big you are, you need insects. And even if you don't eat insects, you need insects. This is a sharp shin hawk. It's a bird predator. And you might think, well, I can get rid of all the insects in my neighborhood and still have sharp shin hawks. 
But think about it. If you get rid of all the insects in your neighborhood, you've also gotten rid of the birds that this guy eats. So he needs insects indirectly. Same with the garter snake. He's not eating very many insects directly. He's eating the frogs and toads that ate the insects. So a world without insects is a world without biological diversity. And E.O. Wilson told us decades ago that a world without biological diversity is a world without humans. So this is, this is important stuff. What's happening to that biological diversity? What's happening to the species that rely on insects? Uh, well, you know, birds are a great example of things that rely on insects and they are not doing well. State of the Birds report way back in 2016 recognized 432 species of North American birds that are at risk of extinction. Not because there's only five left, but because they're declining at such a, a rapid rate. That's the signal of impending extinction. Then uh, 2019, this paper came out, said we have lost 3 billion breeding birds in North America in the last 50 years. That's a third of the North American bird population gone. Well, what's happening here? Yes, we're losing our insects, but, um, and there's lots of reasons for that. We're losing the birds, we're losing biodiversity. Why can't these things be uh, sustained in the parks and preserves that we have? We do have parks and we do have preserves. There are a couple of reasons, but um, the biggest one is that those parks and those preserves are too small and too isolated from each other. When you take a large area like this and you shrink it down to a, to a little habitat fragment, and this is an exaggeration, you're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small populations. And that's the problem. Small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why is that? Because all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up. In bad times, they go down. The top line is a large population. But even in its down cycle here, there's so many individuals in this large population that it can rebound quickly when times get better. But if you're a tiny population, you have those same normal fl fluctuations, but you often hit zero as you fluctuate. You blink out of your little habitat patch and then you're gone. And unless you recolonize that patch, uh, and many of our, our habitat patches are so isolated, recolonization is impossible. I mean, imagine a, a box turtle crossing a major highway. It's not gonna happen. That's, that's, that means you're permanently gone and that's local extinction. And that's happening in habitats all over the world. There are studies all over the world and some of them are, are more than a century old and they're all telling us the same thing. The natural areas that we have preserved on planet Earth, uh, in most cases, are no longer large enough to sustain the nature that we need them to sustain. Because remember, it is nature that runs our ecosystems. So not only do we have hab uh, habitats that are fragmented, those viable habitats are also invaded. They have been invaded by plants from other continents. Those plants we call invasive species. And this is what they look like in the spring. This is uh, White Clay Creek State Park uh, that I drive by on the way to uh, work before the COVID when I used to go to work. This is what it looks like uh, oh, maybe oh, uh, two weeks from now, the end of March. Uh, plants from Asia leaf out before plants from North America. So every bit of green you see there is a plant from Asia. What are these plants? Well, it's multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and calorie pear and autumn olive and porcelain berry and barberry and, and Norway maple and all these. They're all invasives and they're all escapees from our garden. So now more than a third of the vegetation in uh, white clay and, and most of our parks is from Asia. Remember, Host plant specialization, our insects haven't specialized on any of these. So that's a huge hit on the productivity of our natural areas. How big do we, uh, is that hit? Well, we can actually measure it. We can measure what happens when we replace native plant communities with plants from outside of our local food web. Uh, and, and that's what uh, we've been doing in my lab for the last, I don't know, 2004, I guess, was the first publication. So it's been a while. Um, we've got a number of, of publications uh, that tell us all the same thing. When you take away native plants and you replace them with non-native plants, um, you take a big, big hit on the insect population. Um, so you can read all those and you can, you can uh, you know, get, get all the numbers. But you know what? You're, I know you're not going to read them. And I don't want you to believe me. I want you to test this for yourself. You know, I could be, I could be a Russian agent filling you full of alternative realities here. Um, do this experiment yourself. I call it my 12 by 12 experiment. That's 12 feet by 12 feet uh, mapped out in our, our front yard. Um, 
you can do the same thing. You get to control the amount of life that is in that 12 by 12 space by controlling the type of plants that are there and the amount of plants that are there. You can keep it as grass as it is here. You can get on your hands and knees on Wednesday and count all the biodiversity in that 12 by 12 space. It won't take you long. Uh, and then of course on Saturday, you mow it and kill it all. Or we could put a tree in that space. Let's do that. Let's put a, an oak tree there. So here's an oak tree that I planted uh, in my yard from an acorn. Uh, it is, what is it? I think it's 14 years old in this, this picture. It's about 25 feet, feet tall, which proves a couple things. It proves that oaks do grow. Um, and it proves that they can be free too. So the acorn didn't, didn't cost me a whole bunch. Uh, well, let's conduct a little experiment here. We want to compare the insects that are on this oak with insects that are on non-native plants. So let's walk around this tree. It's filling that 12 by 12 space very nicely. Let's walk around and count the caterpillars just on the lower branches. We're not going to climb any, any uh, ladders and fall off or anything. And let's do it on July 25th of 2014. We're going to find 410 caterpillars from 19 different species. And then we're going to stand back and take that picture so I can ask you, how many of those caterpillars do you see? None. How much caterpillar damage do you see? None. But this is the distance at which we view our trees. But if I knocked on your door and said, you have 410 caterpillars on your oak tree, ah, get the, get the can, spray the, spray the tree, save the tree, the caterpillars are going to kill it. They're not going to kill it. That level of herbivory is normal. That the oak is sharing part of its energy with the, uh, particularly the birds in our yard. And that's why we have birds in, in our yard. I met a woman, uh, Tammany Baumgarten in New Orleans a couple of years ago, who suggested that we all practice the 10 step programs. Take, take 10 steps back from your tree and all of your insect problems disappear. And I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, suggestion. Okay, we did white oak, now let's do black cherry. Same day, uh, same yard, we'll walk around the, the uh, this is same sized tree, walk around the bottom branches here, count the caterpillars, 239 caterpillars from 14 different species. Okay, those are two uh, native plants in my yard. Let's go to my neighbor's yard now and look at what's happening on calorie pear. Some people know it as Bradford pear. Uh, first, we have to choose which one we're going to measure because he's got 32 of them. Let's measure this. Actually, the first thing we have to do is make sure he's not home. Okay, not home. We'll walk around here, 12 by 12, count the caterpillars on the lower branches. I bet you think I'm going to tell you there were no caterpillars on that tree. Not so. There was one. One inchworm, one species. Then we'll go to his burning bush, another highly invasive uh, plant. Calorie pear, by the way, you know, top invasive in the east. We'll far carve out a 12 by 12 section, count the caterpillars. I got four caterpillars from one species, four little leaf skeletonizers that are too small to be part of a local food web. Okay, that is one replicate of an experiment. We're comparing natives with non-natives and those are the results we, we got. That's how you do science, but we only did it once. So we could have gotten those results by chance. That does happen. So we have to repeat this time and time again before we're confident. So let's do it again the next day. We'll call it replicate two. We're gonna use the same species, but different individuals. We're gonna get the same pattern. We get different numbers, but the same pattern. 233 on the white oak, 53 in the black cherry, two in the burning bush and one on the calorie pear. And this is, uh, that's the pattern you're gonna get no matter how many times you do it, because these are non-native plants. They have not been here long enough to support the specialized interactions that are much of nature. So they're contributing very little uh, while at the same time, they're pushing out the native plants that do support um, most of our, our caterpillar species and run our ecosystems. Rick Dark and I gave a talk in Williamsburg, Virginia uh, a couple of years ago, and we drove home. You have to drive across the, the uh, Bay Bridge and come up the eastern shore of Maryland. And the first establishment you get to after the Bay Bridge is the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill. And it just happened to be when all the calorie pears were in full bloom. And of course, this is why people plant them. They have a very nice white bloom for uh, about a week. Um, and that apparently that was the only plant that the Sunset Beach Inn and, Inn and Grill used to landscape. So we stopped and took a picture. Then we kept driving. And the very next property was this one, which I found out was owned by a land conservancy. I don't know how many acres it is, but look, it is thoroughly invaded with the offspring from the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill's calorie pears. 
and this is the this is the uh, you know moral dilemma of horticulture these days. People would argue that uh, you know property rights, the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill has the right to plant anything they want, but do they have the right to biologically pollute all the land around them, to ecologically castrate it, load load this property with a plant that's making one caterpillar? And, and you know that's exactly what has happened. I can drive from New York City to Richmond, Virginia, actually much farther south now, and it's white in the spring, all the way down from calorie pears that nobody planted. They're all, all escapees. That's what an invasive species does. So Roy Dennis in uh, England uh, said a few years ago that land ownership is more than a privilege, it's a responsibility. Uh, and you know I couldn't agree with, with him more. You own a piece of the earth, you are now responsible for uh, res for res stewardship of, of the life on that that piece of the planet. So how are you going to do that? You have to pick the right plants, the ones that are, are going to support most of the life around us. And to find out what they are, you go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website or the Plants for Birds website from Audubon. Uh, and put in your zip code and the ranked list of the best plants for your county will pop up. Um, one of the things uh, to make the list for, for those websites uh, we discovered is that there are huge differences among our native plants in terms of their ability to support caterpillars. Why do I talk about caterpillars? Because they are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. Uh, so they're critical to sustaining food reds. I've started calling the plants that are best at supporting caterpillars keystone plants. Now remember the Roman arch the stone in the middle of that arch is called, called the keystone. If you take that stone out, the arch collapses. If you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses. They're that important. What we found is that just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of that caterpillar food that drives the food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs, which means 85% of our native plants are contributing, but um, not all that much, not all that much. I think of keystone plants, if we're building an ecological house, the keystone plants are the, the two by fours. They're holding the house up, they're essential. You're not gonna build a house out of wallpaper, but they're not the only thing you need. If you left, stopped your house with two by fours, you'd have a very drafty house. Um, so they're essential, but we do need to add other, other plants. Here are the uh, typical keystone plants you're going to find for much of the Midwest. Oaks are very high, cherries, uh, native cherries, native birches, native willows, native maples. Notice I say native, native, native. If I go to the nursery and say, I wanna buy a cherry, almost certainly they will sell me a flowering uh, Asian cherry um, that, that blooms in the spring. If I wanna buy a birch, they'll sell me a European birch. If I wanna buy a ma maple, they'll sell me the Japanese maple or a willow, it'll be weeping willow. Most of these, these plants in the trade are non-native plants. So you have to specify that you want a native member of these native genera, or you're going to have 65% fewer caterpillars produced. We've done that experiment. If you use non-native members of these native genera, these are the top herbaceous plants. Goldenrod's very high, followed by the several genera of asters, um, our sunflowers, perennial sunflowers in particular. Those three genera alone uh, are, well, goldenrods support 110 species of caterpillars and the others add more, <clears throat> but they're also top in terms of producing or supporting these specialist bees. Uh, a third of our 4,000 species of native bees can only reproduce in the pollen of particular plant genera. So these three together support um, at least 40 species of native bees. If you don't have goldenrods, asters, and sunflowers in your yard, you're going to be short 40 species of bees that you could have. Okay, what's the best keystone plant? Well, in 84% of the counties, it is oaks. In the middle Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars, 900 species of caterpillars nationwide. There's no other uh, plant genus that comes close to that. Compared to uh, you know, some of our, our typical ornamentals like ginkgos, you know, there are two rare records of caterpillars on ginkgos. You're never going to find them. I've never found them. So let's just say zero, not very big. Let's compare it to our native prunus, 456 species of caterpillars in the mid-Atlantic states. <clears throat> and the numbers are very similar for the Midwest as well. 
compared to Zelkova, really common these days. And, and you know, you're not going to find Zelkova on any invasive species list, but let me tell you, it is. And I know that because I go to my mother-in-law's retirement community. The streets are lined with Zelkova and the woods are filled with Zelkova. That's what an invasive species does. Well, these are words zero. That's what the plants look like. You know, nothing eaten out of those leaves, which of course is a signal they're not contributing any energy to the local food web. Why don't you plant a, a plastic uh, Zelkova and it'll contribute as much to the, to the ecosystem as, as the living one. And then you don't have to worry about watering it. Um, Pieris Japani used to be the most common foundation plant in, in North America. We have a native Pieris, but it's one of those natives that doesn't support very much, only two species. Uh, I've never even seen the native, native Pieris. It could have been a native vi viburnum that supports 103 species. So all I'm saying here is that plant choice matters. We, we, you get to control the amount of life in your yard by choosing the right plants. If you think of your plants as if they, if they are bird feeders, it might be easier to visualize that. So there you go, they're bird feeders. Now you get to control how well you're gonna feed the birds with your bird feeders. You can put in a lot of bird feeders, or just a few. This is what the landscapes around me look like. They're giant lawns with very few plants at all. And the plants that are there are, are non-native. You can put food in your bird feeders. In other words, plant the native plants that make a lot of caterpillars, or you can keep them empty. There's the ginkgo back there. It's a big tree, but it's not making any food for the, for the birds. And if you uh, don't choose those productive plants, we're not fooling the birds. Um, let me give you an example from uh, another well, one of my grad students, Desiree Narango, who did some wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., uh, she wanted to know how well chickadee populations were sustained in suburban neighborhoods like this that uh, were dominated by non-native plants versus neighborhoods dominated by, by native plants. So she had a whole bunch of chickadee nests set up. This is one here. That's where the nest was. This red line represents uh, where 90% of the foraging to feed the birds in that nest happened. So this is the territory they did most of their foraging and it's about 50 meters from the nest. And the blue areas are the trees on which they did that foraging. And if we look at what they were, they're all the native plants in this, this little, little area here. Basswood and sweet gum, American elm, black cherry, two species of oaks. But let's also look at the non-native plants that were in that neighborhood that the chickadees didn't forage on at all, because of course there's no food there. And those are all the plants from Asia, the Japanese maples, the silk trees, the ginkgo and black poplar, crepe myrtle, saucer magnolia. And it's very easy to picture a neighborhood where those are the dominant trees. And when that happens, this can happen. This is a failed nest, and after Desiree took the three dead chicks out of the nest, she noticed a bunch of sunflower seeds in the bottom of the nest. And what she thinks happened is, remember, baby chickadees cannot eat seeds, but she thinks somebody had a bird feeder up, the parents ran out of caterpillars, so they brought seeds back anyway, hoping the babies could eat them. They couldn't, and, and they died. They starved to death. Um, so there are real consequences to landscaping with plants that don't support the food web. Uh, when she compared those landscapes dominated by natives with landscapes dominated by introduced plants, this is what she found. The introduced landscapes produced 75% fewer caterpillars. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Even though there was a nest box up, the chickadees would come and look at it and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even going to try to reproduce. If they did try to reproduce, they contained, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. Now, if you put all the data into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native plants, woody plants in your landscape, from none to 100%, this is what you get. Uh, this dotted line is replacement rate. This is the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at this, this rate, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you reproduce over here and make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. But if you're below this line, you have, you're making fewer babies than adults die, you have a shrinking, unsustainable population. Right here is where those lines overlap generously. Uh, which suggests you can have up to 30% of your, your woody plant biomass non-native in your yard and still have a, a sustainable uh, food web breeding bird population, as long as it doesn't exceed 30%. 
So in other words, if you have at least 70% of your woody plant biomass native, and those productive natives would be, would be the best, then you can sustain breeding birds. Uh, so this is good news to me for, for two reasons. This is the first time this has been measured for any bird anywhere. Um, so if you, if you doubt whether your plant choice actually impacts the life around you, um, read this paper. But it also uh, uh, introduces the, the, the idea that there's room for compromise here. Look, you can have, you can have your, your ginkgo, you can have your crepe myrtle, you can have your boxwood, no, nothing that's invasive, but you can have some of those treasured non-native plants as long as they don't dominate the landscape. So that's compromise. And I think that's very valuable because if my message was you can't have any non-natives, I'd have very small audiences. We love our non-natives. It's not the presence of non-natives that destroys food webs. It's the absence of natives. If we add those native plants to our landscapes, we can tolerate many of these non-natives. Desiree also looked at the number of, uh, of migrating birds that stopped in her, her uh, suburban plots. 51 species stopped uh, during the migration. So that's called the stopover point. Um, birds, when they migrate, fly all night long. Uh, and in the around five o'clock in the morning, they come down and people say they have to rest. But what they really have to do is gas up. They're out of gas. So when they come down in the land of ginkgo, there's nothing to eat. And that could very well be the end of their migration because they have to fuel. They have to eat a lot of caterpillars before they, they start to fly again. So a lot of people say, well, I don't have a, a property big enough to support a breeding bird. And that may be true. But if your property is big enough to support a single tree and you make it the right tree, uh, you can support migrating birds and they will stop and, and use your property. Doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you, you really can save it where you live with your plant choice. What we need to do is raise the bar for what we ask our landscapes to do. You know, in the past, we've asked them to do one thing, be pretty, and we're good at that. But now in addition to being pretty, they have to do four other things. All landscapes have to do that. They have to support life. They have to support a viable food web or we're gonna lose the life and that will collapse our ecosystems. They have to sequester carbon for obvious reasons. Plants are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, building their tissues out of it and then pumping the extra carbon into our soils. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have stored there. We have so much carbon in the atmosphere now, we've gotta get it back into the soil. And plants are what's going to do that. Plants are also managing our watershed. They're cleaning our water and managing our, our water. Uh, so when we take plants away from our, our landscapes, we destroy the watershed. And they have to support viable pollinator populations. These are the things that have to happen. We're not talking about good stewardship here. We're talking about essential land stewardship. These things have to happen on all pieces of land if we're going to turn around the biodiversity crisis that we, we have right now. How much is, of those things are happening right here? Almost none. Almost none. If your property doesn't generate all the ecosystem services you use, then you're going to have to borrow them from someplace else. You're not going to borrow them from your neighbor. He's not making any either. You're probably not going to borrow them from your, your uh, township's open space if it looks like my township's open space, which is a huge lawn with a paved path around it and people walk in circles around it. You're not going to borrow them from my neighbor's house. This is a neighbor down the street um, where he loves his lawn. It's a perfect lawn. But look, there's no food web here. Uh, plant is uh, uh, Lawn is the worst plant choice for sequestering carbon. Uh, it's the best plant, uh, plant choice for ruining your watershed. Uh, and of course, he's supporting no pollinators here. So this, this is an ecological disaster, even though you know it's our great status symbol. And here is my, my neighbor's house with his 32 bread for pears. 100% of the, of the plants he has put on his property are non-native plants. And he's got 10 acres. It's a lot of non-native plants. Why has he done that? Well, he just does what, what the other neighbors do, not me. Uh, he goes to the nursery, he's looking for something pretty. We think our plants are just decorations. So, you know, uh, does it have decorative value? Is it a screen or an anchor or a focal point? All the decisions have been about aesthetics for the last century or so, without any thought to the ecological role that our plants need to start playing in our landscapes. What we could do is pick uh, pretty plants that have, that, that, that produce ecosystem services, that, that do support a food web, that support pollinator habitat, that support our natural enemies, that sequester carbon, that do all the things we need all of our plants to do. 
So what does a, a biodiversity, biodiversity friendly neighborhood look like? There are three things that have to happen. Uh, we need to, to create biological carters that connect the natural areas that remain out there. Remember, they're isolated. We need to connect them by building viable habitats right where we live. And the only way we're going to do that is reduce the area that is now in lawn, because we have over 40 million acres in lawn, which is the size of New England. Um, and we have to begin that transition of, of uh, changing from our, our love of, of non-native ornamentals to native ornamentals. So this is what we've done in the past. We, we built our house and then we usually put in a foundation planting and a few trees here and there. Then we're exhausted, no more landscaping. So everything by default has become lawn. We all have better busy lives, so we leave it that way. It's lawn. Let's turn that on its head. Let's build the house and now figure out where we want, where we do want lawn. I'm not suggesting we get rid of lawn. It's the perfect plant to walk on. So figure out where we're, where we're going to walk. I look at where my neighbor walks on his 10 acres. Nowhere, You're never outside. But what if you want to get married in the front yard? You got to have some lawn there. What if you want to walk to the backyard, a nice path, throw the Fisbee, have a barbecue? Where are we going to use your yard consistently? That's where the lawn goes. Then everything else by default becomes heavily planted. So we're just flipping that landscape paradigm on its head. And, uh, you know, if, if all the neighbors do that, then you've got that connectivity with the woodlot that's over here and the woodlot that's over here. Uh, and um, you no longer will have an exodus of species from your neighborhood. They will actually start to come. Look, we still have lawn. We can still play with our lawnmowers. It'll be OK. And if we cut the area of lawn in half, we've got 40 million acres right now, more than 40 million acres. So let's let's say it's 40. If we cut it in half, that gives us 20 million acres that we could use for conservation. We could build a new national park that would be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all those, all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. And if we do this at home, we can call it Homegrown National Park. So let's do that. This is the Toledo Zoo, I believe. Um, let's take this very nice grass median here filled with dandelions and turn it into this. You know, the zoo did this without uh, uh, consulting the board of directors and the board of directors had a fit. They thought nobody would come to the zoo anymore. It's really hard to change culture, folks. Let's take these square things. Uh, and, and turn it into a landscape like this. This is, now this is a high-end landscape on Fisher's Island. I should have included more of the house. It's a, it's a fancy house. But this landscape is doing everything I talked about. It's sequestering carbon. Um, it is, it is uh, supporting food webs. These are all oaks here. It's managing the watershed. The only thing it's not doing really well because oaks are wind pollinated is supporting pollinators. So let's put a pollinator garden in as well. Then we've covered, we've covered the basis. Uh, and I don't think anybody's going to really complain about a landscape like that. Now, here's the new, you know, the new uh, ethic in our, our farming communities is to get rid of the weeds, the native plants on the side of all the fields and put in grass. It looks very classy, but that's the major reason we've lost the monarch, by the way. You can turn it around. This is what Iowa is doing. Uh, they've got more than a, th a thousand miles of uh, restored roadways in, in Iowa that are very productive. We can take this this mulch sculpture, um, and you know this proves you can't use native plants formally. Uh, it's got to be got to be non non native. Except nobody told the folks in Indianapolis. This is an all native garden uh, in a very formal landscape, and this is the first year it was planted uh, as well. So it probably looks pretty good now. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're non native plants over there. This is the corporate landscape that invites the employees to come out at, at noon to get uh, sunburn. It could be a, a landscape like this um, that is, uh, you know, there's, there's really amazing research that shows exposure to a landscape like this for as, as little as 15 minutes can produce measurable medical benefits. I, I know you've all heard this, but um, you know, your blood pressure drops, your, your, your cortisol, your stress hormone drops. Um, you don't get cancer anymore. You don't get divorced anymore. All kinds of wonderful things happen when you expose yourself to natural areas like this. Uh, and, and, you know, you can't just go to, 
to Yellowstone for two weeks in the summer and expect those those benefits to last. You've got to expose yourself to landscapes like this every day. And the best way to do that is to have them at home or or where you work. And I wasn't kidding about curing cancer and not getting divorced because the you know, the the uh, research is showing that um, when we reduce our stress level, our cortisol, uh, we are nicer people. We treat other people nicer. We are much healthier. We're more productive. We learn better. We heal better. We do absolutely everything better with less stress. And, and for some reason, exposure to nature gives us that, that type of uh, stress reduction. So let's add mental health up here uh, or physical health as another ball on the side of our, our ecological value of native plants. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, you can go to our, our new website, homegrownnationalpark.org, and get yourself on the map. Follow the directions for uh, recording uh, where you live, the amount of property you have, and how much you are planting in natives, how much of your lawn you, you're converting. And the object is to, to light up the map with everybody who's joining in here. Uh, we've got, what do we have? I think it's over 4,000 people that have joined at this point. Um, the goal is to convert 20 million acres. We're about one percent, so we need a little bit, a uh, little bit more uh, participation here. But tell your, tell your neighbors, have a contest with your, with your other people in your county, and see who can get on the map more. How do you know when you've succeeded? Well, there's lots of ways to know when you've succeeded, but um, this is the primary way: when you have holes in your leaves. This is holistic gardening. This is a shingle oak in my yard that uh, has given up part of its energy to a caterpillar, which is now in the belly of, of a bird. And if the shingle oak hadn't done that, I wouldn't have the caterpillar and I wouldn't have the bird. That's a sign of success. If you have leaves with nothing eaten out of them, that's a sign of failure. You've got a dead landscape there because all the energy is still locked up in the leaves of your plants. If you have fireflies come back, you know, I get asked all the time, uh, what happened to the fireflies I used to see when I was when I was a, a child? Um, fireflies, lightning bugs, they're not bugs and they're not flies. They're actually beetles. That's what the adult looks like. And this is the luminescent organ uh, down here. Uh, that's how they communicate sexually. This is what the larvae look like. They look like little dinosaurs. They also glow, by the way. People call them glow worms. But they're predators in leaf litter. If you rake up all the leaf litter and you throw it out, uh, you've thrown around uh, where they live. You've thrown out the moisture that keeps them alive. And you've also thrown out all of their prey. Uh, so if you have your, your lights on all night long, you've ruined their sexual communication. And if you spray uh, herbicides uh, or pesticides on your lawn, you, you've killed them that way. So if you get fireflies coming back, you're doing lots of things right. But the big measure, of course, is whether you have breeding birds. You're not going to have breeding birds on your property unless you have enough food to support them. That's the best measure. So we could save nature, but only if we learn to live with nature. Fortunately, nature is, is really malleable. It's re very resilient and it's very forgiving, not endlessly forgiving. But I do think she will give us one more chance. Thanks very much. I'm done. Great, we're, we're pushing buttons. <laughs> All right. And Richard, uh, okay. Um, Doug, I'll, we're going to let you take a 60 second break, get a drink of water or whatever clear liquid that is you're consuming. I got, and, I got my water right here. So okay, I'm great. Set whenever you're ready. Um, I was going to invite uh, Pam Carlson to say a word, introduce herself to uh, both chapters because she's going to be our next speaker. And I believe you two are acquainted uh, from various scenarios. We are. Where are you, Pam? <laughs> um, Richard, you may need to unmute her. Okay, I'm looking for her on the participants. There we go. Am I on? Yes. Hello. <laughs> start your screen so we can see you. Uh, start video. Let's see. That's right. There we go. Okay. Hello. Hey, Pam. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Doug. How are you? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Great presentation. I always learn a ton. <laughs> mm, thanks. <laughs> so, Pam's yeah, looking. Nice 
Well, go ahead. It's nice to see you in person. We've been exchanging emails the past several days, working out some details for your presentation, but uh, thank you for joining in tonight. And just why don't you give everybody a repeat of the title of your talk and we'll move on from there. Uh, so I'll be talking next month. It's called Birds in the Garden, Creating and Enjoying a Bird Oasis. And um, it's a very small urban yard and taking all these principles. I mean, I've been doing this for like 25 years and I'm up to 118 um, bird species sighted in our garden. So it's definitely an oasis and it really works. Well, I was going to mention to you that I think Doug has set a pretty high bar. So I admire you willing to being willing to speak right after Doug's presentation. She's, she's up to it. I've heard her. She's up uh, to it. Well, that, that's what her selection told me is, wow, this, this lady's got to be pretty good and confident. So we're looking forward to you uh, speaking in April. Great. Well, thanks for inviting me. I'm looking I'm forward glad to you're it. able to come. Okay, uh, you ready for some questions, Doug? I am. Okay. Um, let, let me find the first one that I picked out. And Janine, just jump in whenever you have one uh, as well. But um, Karen asks uh, if you've ever been involved in installing or maintaining or participating in uh, native gardens in elementary schools or other schools. No. Um, I'm not a I'm not a designer like like Pam. I mean, this is what Pam's talk is going to give you. But um, you know, I've communicated with with schools, and they're interesting philosophies. Schools have said we want to put natives in our yard, but nothing um, that flowers, because we don't want any bees. And of course, the the opinion is if you have a flowering plant, the bees are going to sting all the kids. Uh, which, of course, is, you know, it's, it's not true, but fear teens seems to dominate the use of, of native plants, as if honeybees won't go to a non-native plant for some reason. Uh, but actually, more and more schools are, are thinking about um, what they do with their properties and the educational value of putting these plants in. You know, if you have schools that go from, uh, say, kindergarten through sixth grade, that's six years where those kids can watch things happen in, in a particular place on their landscape. They can actually set up experiments that last for years and measure differences. And some of the, you know, the teachers are recognizing this. Um, I've often talked about you know, the master naturalist programs we have around the country. I'd love to see master naturalist programs for kids that they could do after school right on the property there. Uh, right now, we wait till we're all retired before we, we take advantage of, of nature. That's great, but we've got to get the kids going too. So we can do a lot more with our, our schoolyards. Um, unfortunately, they're, you know, they're always short with, with budgets and uh, they do need some runaround space. Uh, so all those things have to be taken into account, but a lot of schools own quite a bit of property. And um, even if it's just thinking carefully about tree choice uh, and how to treat the area under the trees, you can, you can get a lot of very important lessons across to the kids and the teachers as well. Yeah, the Middle Tennessee chapter uh, volunteers right now, one of the Metro Nashville public schools, and that's where Karen teaches. And they have a, they, they have a pretty good sustainability program and that's catching on somewhat in, in spot schools across Metro uh, schools. They're applying for a grant from the Green Schoolyard Program. There's also a program out of University of Chicago. I think it's called Bud Burst. I don't know as much about that, but you can download curriculum guides for any grade level you want and then have some sort of a garden or natural area that they can do these experiments in. So now I remember to my own grade school, um, I guess it was fifth and sixth grade. There was a little stream in the back. We weren't supposed to go there, but sometimes during research, we would recess, we would sneak over and there were little salamanders in the stream. It was a great, great time uh, to, to be illegal and go, <laughs> but it was there. They weren't taking advantage of it, but, but a few of us did, so. Um, I have a question about the, um article uh, that you wrote with Dr. Narango and Mara. Mm -hmm. You uh, show us this graph, which has the confidence intervals for various uh, gradations of native plants. And the first time that confidence inter interval contains the R equals zero line, the replacement is at 30% uh, non-natives. Non well, that's, so, that's generous. Those, that's yeah. the top of the confidence interval, but we'll be generous, so. Right. <laughs> So 
I was wondering if you say 70% because you really don't want to say 94%, which is where the 50-50 chance uh, occurs because 94% that's why we, that's, is- That's why we're being generous. Um, now, one thing we haven't done with that study that we still have the data and we got to go back and do it, but uh, you know, Desiree's off in a postdoc now and really busy. That is looking at all native plants. It's not looking at those keystone plants. I would love to rework that graph only looking at the percentage of keystone plants you have in your property. And I think it would tighten up considerably because remember there are a lot of native plants that don't produce a whole lot. I could build a 100% native landscape that uh, produces very, very little. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the plants that Desiree were, was measuring as good natives, they are good natives, but they're not very productive. So I think it would change the nature of that graph considerably if we only looked at the, the percentage of keystone plants that were on the properties. And I do want to do that at some point. Yeah, that would kind of merge that paper with your few Keystone plant genera paper that you co-wrote with Dr. Narango as well. But right. I forget the numbers, but if a small percentage of Keystone plants support a majority of the- Yeah, 14% support 90% of the, of the caterpillars. Right. So, so yeah. the question then is, uh, you know, how do we measure the effectiveness of keystone plants. And a lot of the data is genera wide. And so yeah. with um, Heather Holm and uh, Prairie Moon Nursery have put out a, a, uh, a insect plant interaction table that goes down to the genus level for many of the flowering um, you know, perennial plants. Mm -hmm. And so in looking over that, it's, it's obvious that in the Rudbeckia genus, the black-eyed Susan genus, not all Rudbeckias are equal. And the, one of them performs much worse according to the data there than the other Rudbeckias. And so that's, that's actually very useful to a gardener because you don't have to guess which, which Rudbeckia you want to pick. It's kind of mapped out for you. So in, in, your, in your studies and in this Heather Holm study, uh, which is just uh, observational, how well do you think those in, that information translates geographically and among the different uh, species, species in the, in the species, genuses? Yeah. Well, the reason we, we stuck at the genus level was because uh, that's, that's what's in the literature. Most of the time they'll say eats oaks. They don't tell you which oaks it eats. And rather than throw out most of the data because we didn't know the, the species that it was collected on, we decided to keep it at the genus level. But you're absolutely right. Uh, all members of a genus are not equal, and some are going to be better than, than others. We actually have a, a student who's, I mean, right now, I, should have the, I could have the data next week, comparing 16 species of oaks in terms of their ability to, to uh, support caterpillars. And um, I'll have a much better feel for which of the, the top producing ones. But for most plant genera, it, it just this hasn't been done yet. It would be great to know these things, but we don't because this is natural history data, you know, going out and collecting something, seeing what it's eat, actually eating and recording it reliably. Um, poor host plant records are, are uh, very common. People misidentify the plant where a caterpillar is moving to pupate and they see it crawling across uh, a plant. Like for example, one of the records on ginkgo is a cecropia moth where this cocoon is on the ginkgo branch. Well, they, you know, the cecropia moths crawl about 25 minutes before they spin the cocoon. And I'm sure he just crawled up there and spun the cocoon, but he wasn't eating that ginkgo. But it's hard for people to, to you know, pick that apart. And that's why the, these, these host records are, um, it's very easy to, uh, for them to be misleading. Tough data to get, and maybe someday we'll have it. I would love to be able to grind up an insect and know, as an adult and know what it ate as a larva, because then you could get it you know, some fancy DNA analysis, then you could have a real record. Um, but everybody tells me can't be done because in the pupil stage, it dissolves everything and you don't get any, any uh, real record of the host plant. But, but you're right, it's a weakness of, the, of all of these studies is that we're, we're stuck with the genus level right now. We do have a, a question from Lori Ward, which is related. Are native ours beneficial to insects and birds? The answer is it depends. Okay. Um, so you have a straight species, a native var is a cultivar of a native plant. It's a genetic variant of that native plant. And it depends on what the, the, the genetic change was that created that variant. We got thousands of types of cultivars, but there, we did one study 
um, looking at what happens in woody plants with six common cultivar traits. Uh, and one was taking a tall plant, making it short, um, changing leaf color from green to red or purple or variegated, enhancing fruit size in the fall, changing fall color, introducing disease resistance. Those were the major ones, I think. Uh, and we did a three-year common garden experiment looking at insect use. And the only thing that consistently changed insect use and thus benefit to the birds was... Um, taking a green leaf and making it red or purple because that loads the leaf with anthocyanins and makes it distasteful. And then the insects won't, won't eat it. Um, there's anecdotal evidence that uh, some of the um, Ilex verticillata cultivars that make the berry larger, that you get to the end of the season, those berries still haven't been eaten. Um, so they're saying, well, they're too large for the birds to eat. I don't know, maybe somebody's got to study that uh, uh, you know, in a, in a standardized way to verify that, but that's a possibility. Um, pollinators, uh, you know, most of our cultivars do focus on plants and Annie White at the University of Vermont has done some work with that. But again, there's thousands and thousands of cultivars out there. Uh, her results suggest that um, they're a little bit, uh, they're not as happy as our results because any change to a flower is probably going to disrupt the relationship between that flower and specialist bees. They have very specific relationships. If you en enhance the flower size, if you make the petals bigger, um, you know, if you make an echinacea look like a zinnia, uh, what's that do to the pollen level? What's that do to the nectar level? What's it do to the, the um, sugar levels and the, the nectar the act and the pollen nutrition? Almost none of that has been, been measured. But Annie did find that pollination, the pollen, the visitors, um, visitation dropped off more often than not, not always, but more often than not when you fold around with, with flowers. The thing that bothers me the most about cultivars is that they're propagated clonally. So um, that's zero genetic variability, uh, which that robs the plant of you know, the stuff of evolution. That's what natural selection works on. If you take away genetic variability, how are our plants going to adapt to climate change and all the other things that we're, we're throwing at them? So I would love to see straight species offered in the nursery trade at the same rate that the cultivars are offered. So that if you want to get a straight species, you have the option. Right now, you know, so often you go to the nursery and it's simply not there. Now you can request it. And that's what I suggest you do. Uh, so because if the nurserymen hear often enough that, you know, people want stray species for, for, uh, for function, we know the stray species works, they ought to be able to get it. And if they just want to make sure there's a market there. So I think we can increase the percentage of straight species in the, in the marketplace. Thank you. We have a, a question from Nathan Fields. Is there any data on how the most recent winter storms and prolonged days of freezing have impacted our local bird communities or our insect populations? You know, I just I don't know anything about the bird community um, yet, but I did hear this week uh, how the freeze has knocked out the blooming plants for the migrating monarchs. And it's a real disaster. They're coming up out of Mexico and there's absolutely nothing in bloom. So there's no, there's no nectar source to get them on their way. There's also no, no milkweeds. They were frozen back uh, as well. Um, but I can see the monarchs uh, delaying reproduction, but they still need the nectar to be able to, to stay alive, to, to move north. So um, that is a real problem. Because if you, if you remember the, the uh, jet stream that went all the way down to Southern Texas, it was wide. I mean, it covered not just Texas, but Oklahoma, and, you know, a huge area where you knock out the host plants for the monarch. This is, this is not good at all. So, um, it also knocked them out for hummingbirds with people say put up hummingbird feeders and okay, that's, that's great. But what are we going to do about the monarch? So I, I, you know, we'll see, we'll see. Um, Christine Campbell wants to know, I need to clear honeysuckle and ivy from a 0.4 wooded acre on my property. How do I begin? On your hands and knees. <laughs> You know, there's just no happy story about the invasives we brought into our properties. Ivy is really, really tough because it puts down little roots as it goes. 
So, you know, one alternative is to spray the whole thing with, and filled with a, a surfactant so that it actually gets into the leaves. But, um, you know, nuking the area has consequences. Um, if it's solid ivy, you know, I, I, my, my grandchildren live in Portland, Oregon, and I see some real solid ivy places. And I, I say, well, maybe nuking it is the, is the, <laughs> the answer. And then you can start all over. But, um, you know, if hand pulling is, is a, a viable option for you, then just pick out a list. Say, I'm going to do a, a 10 by 10 square foot area this week, you know, and just, just keep doing it. You really can win that, that uh, you know, that challenge. We have 10 acres. It was solid with invasives, not ivy, but many other things. And my wife, Cindy, got rid of most of it over, over the course of years. I mean, she goes out and she that's what she does for fun. So that'll do it. But um, if you want it done fast, I can't think of any other way other than, than herbicide. Well, Jenny asks, how can I gradually evolve my property into native species without damaging the infrastructure of the yard? Should I add a native tree and then remove the non-native when the native is large enough to support the same level of water erosion management? Okay, that's good. That's a good question. Um, and what you suggest is a good solution. <laughs> you, you know, it's plant roots that are, are uh, managing the water on your property. And um, so if you can transfer from native to, from non-native to native without changing the level of plant roots, that would be great. Uh, but you know, ground covers <clears throat> can, can um, soften the, uh, the impact of very hard rains and capture an awful lot of, of water and so can leaf litter. So if you increase ground covers and leaf litter on your property, you can manage a lot of water as those other the tree roots are, are getting established. Um, but, but that's good. If you're thinking that way, you're almost certainly going to succeed because you're starting to think like a plant. That's good. So. Uh, Barbara would like to know if the butterfly bush is invasive in South Central Kentucky. Uh, yes. <laughs> you know, I've never gone and measured it in South Central Kentucky, but I've also, you know, there's nothing special about South Central Kentucky's climate that would tell me it's not going to be invasive. It's invasive in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's taken over entire Hawaiian islands. Um, it's invasive in, in, in uh, New Jersey. Why wouldn't it be invasive in Kentucky? I can't think of any reason. So in this case, um, it's better to be conservative rather than, than have it be the next bush honeysuckle that, you know, it, it's just almost impossible to get rid of. It's also on the invasive list in, list in Tennessee. It, it's invasive in England. I've seen it <laughs> there you go. Yeah. The railroad tracks. And, and okay. Stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm not, if I missed a uh, question in the chat, if you want to put it in again, if there's, or a question you've got, uh, we have a few more minutes. Waiting for people to type. So I, I get. I have a question. Um, you started out as an entomologist, and I'm still an entomologist. Yeah, sorry, I didn't know that. But, um, but now you, you. When did you start talking to people about plants? How long have you been doing that? Well, when we moved into our, our property here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Um, that was my first encounter with serious invasive uh, plant problems. Uh, and that was when I realized they were, they were really uh, impacting insect problems. And that's when I started to do research on it. Uh, and local bird groups heard that I was doing research on it. Somebody published a paper saying, Talamy says we're gonna lose the birds, which I didn't say, and we had no data about it, but that's, that's what the article said. Uh, so bird groups started to invite me to come tell them about how we're losing our birds because of invasive plants. And, um, you know, then we actually started to get, get data, but those were the first talks and it was just word of mouth. People, people said, uh, okay, we want to hear about this too. And it was actually from those early experiences that uh, it, the audience kept saying, what can we read? What can we read? And there was nothing to read. So finally I said, I'll write a pamphlet and the pamphlet became bringing nature home. I and mean, that's how that happened. Uh, and I, I structured the book around the questions that people would ask in talks. 
So how did it happen? It was an accident. I just you know, stepped into it. That's how. A very happy accident. Uh, these next two are, are sort of related. Tom says, how do I get my city to adopt these concepts? And Susan says, do you have an example of a municipality that is leading its residents to planting natives? To increase, you know, there's, gr there's growing numbers in St. Louis is doing a really good job. There's a number of initiatives in, in St. Louis. Um, uh, Reston, Virginia, years ago, uh, changed their uh, landscaping rules that on public property they all had to be uh, native plants, and more and more people are doing that. I have a copy of a um, an ordinance that uh, Hyattsville, Maryland, wrote. Uh, that I've given out to to several people if they want to get their their you know their township to change ordinances. This is a copy of how to do that. Not happy to send that to anybody. Um, so it's more common than you think these days. There's there's a lot of interest around the country in terms of doing it. And and you know you know about Minnesota's um, um, lawn conversion program where they're actually paying people to put in uh, native prairie plants. Pennsylvania has just started one. It's only two years old now, but you can get up to $5,000 per acre to convert your lawn to natives. Yeah, I was surprised to hear about that. Apparently Virginia has something similar. And uh, so these things are starting to happen. Um, Great. Uh, Joanna would like to know, how do we measure the woody plant volume in our yards to measure against <laughs> the magic 70% minimum? Yeah, um, you know, estimate it. You're, you're measuring really the, think of it in terms of the leaf, the amount of leaf, living leaf material you have. So normally you can, I mean, there are indices that can be used. So if you have a big oak tree, people would measure what you call the diameter at best breast height. You measure the diameter of the trunk. And if you do that consistently across trees, you can, you can compare the biomass of those trees, even though that's just a single measurement. It's just an index of how big that tree is. Uh, but uh, to measure a bush, I mean, you're really thinking about the volume. Is that bush 10 feet high and 10 feet wide? Uh, try to think, come up with a three-dimensional measure, but um, it's a guesstimate. It's a guesstimate, and and uh, you can have one. This is why we don't say count the number of native plants. You can have one big oak tree. You would count it as one, but it could have you know uh, its biomass easily dominate every other tree, every other plant you have in your property. So it's a good question. Uh, I should probably come up with a better answer of how to do that, but. <laughs> I think in the uh, detailed explanation of the paper that Dr. Narango wrote with, with you, she actually built an ellipsoid model that would engulf the plants and then computed the volume of the ellipsoid using a standard formula. Yeah, I'm trying to make it a little bit easier for the yeah, that's, homeowners. That's though. why when you say 70%, nobody's going to actually know if they have 70% or not by volume. No, but if they have four ginkgo trees and one tiny oak, they'll know that, that the ginkgos are dominating. And that's really the where we're going here. Yeah, I think it's more of a concept than a quantitative it's a concept. measure. Yeah, yeah. Karen yeah. wonders if you could talk a little bit about the butterfly bush so we can explain why people shouldn't buy it because everybody seems to love it. Yeah, it's a tough one. It's certainly not number one on my hit list. Uh, it is a plant that makes a lot of nectar. Uh, so it's like putting a hummingbird feeder in your yard that the butterflies and some of the, the generalist bees do use. It's a nectar source, nectar sugar water. That's what they're going for. The problem with butterfly bush, first of all, it's its name because it suggests you're helping a lot of butterflies and you are giving them nectar, but it's not a host plant for any butterfly. So you're not making any butterflies. And butterflies, you know, you got to have reproduction every single year. So you've got to have the host plant. Uh, that's an essential part of any, any butterfly garden is, is producing more butterflies and butterfly bush will never do that, but it makes people think that it is doing that. Uh, and then there's that in, invasive uh, nature. It, uh, it does move, it does spread and it's growing. You know, the, the lag time, a lot of our invasive plants were not invasive in the beginning, but the density of these things reaches a point where then the, the seeds are distributed so widely that um, all of a sudden it is. We, we sold Japanese honeysuckle in the nursery industry for 70 years before it was considered invasive. And nobody sells it anymore because it's everywhere. You know, so we don't want that to happen with, with butterfly bush too. It is pretty, 
and we love pretty and it does make nectar and it does attract butterflies. And it's certainly not the most aggressive invasive that we have. Uh, but, you know, we've got other native plants that attract butterflies too. Joe Pye does a real good job. Buttonbush does a real good job. Um, Clethra, um, um, bottle brush, buckeye. So it's not like it's the only thing that's going to attract your, your butterflies. Just be aware of the problems. And some people say, I'm going to deadhead it. I'll take the seeds off. And if you religiously do that, that'll work. But I know how long that lasts, maybe a week. <laughs> you know, I told someone they should they should plant instead of a butterfly bush, they should plant a caterpillar bush. Um, so, <laughs> Good. One, I like it. So one more question. Um, Ronald asks, can the Chinese chestnut be a viable substitute for the Native American chestnut as a keystone plant? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> no, and I can't give you any any numbers, but uh, it's a different species. It is far better to um, keep your fingers crossed that we can get Chinese chestnut resistant genes into the American chestnut. Um, and the reason it can't be a keystone plant is because the number of insects that will eat Chinese chestnut is going to be far reduced compared to um, uh, the American chestnut. Uh, what's the average? We, you know, we did a common garden experiment with 20 different congeneric comparisons. Chestnut wasn't one of them, but the average reduction in caterpillar use was 65%. So if that holds for chestnut, um, you're, it's going to be 65% poorer than American chestnut in terms of supporting caterpillars, which means it's not going to be a key, keystone plant. Let's get that American chestnut back into our forest. That would be beautiful. They're beautiful trees. So it is um, at the half hour mark, which is uh, the time that Dr. Tommy said he had to share with us tonight. So I wanted to thank you. Lots of happy messages in the chat and we will send them to you so you can read them at your <laughs> Great, okay. Uh, and thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Well, thanks for inviting me. Take yes, care, Thank everybody. you very much. Bye-bye.